um, how long it's been in, uh, uh, how long it's been in existence in its current iteration. Chris Chambers will be giving an introduction to what that is. Action describes the, uh, the process of, in this case, register reports. And we've got two presentations then on the evaluation of the concept of register reports. We've got an all-star cast today. As I mentioned, Chris Chambers, he's a professor of cognitive neuroscience at Cardiff University. He's the chair of the Register Reports Committee uh, for the past roughly about eight years. And he has uh, helped support and implement Register Reports at dozens of different journals, um, helping to bring it along to, in its current format, over 300 journals now offered as a submission option. We're very excited to have Chris join us today. Severa Costa from Nature Human Behavior. She's the chief editor and the founding editor of Nature Human Behavior. Um, and throughout her editorial career, Scarvula has been a strong advocate for um, rigorous research practices um, and has a research background in linguistics and experimental biology. Anne Scheel uh, and Courtney Soderberg will be talking about evaluations of registered reports that have occurred in the past few years. Anne Scheel is a doctoral candidate at the Polytech Institute um, in Eindhoven, uh, the Netherlands. She studies meta science and increasing the reliability and efficiency of psychological science. And my uh, friend and former colleague, Courtney Soderberg, quantitative UX researcher at Facebook, formerly at the Center for Open Science, will be talking about evaluation of virtual reports that has been recently published. So without further ado, I am going to um, pass the screen control over to Chris. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, allow Chris to talk about the implementation of registered reports. Thank you, David. Um, right, welcome everybody. Let me just share my screen here. Um, you don't wanna see my inbox, let's go with that one. All right, shout if that's not working. That looks good. Good, all right, so I've been tasked with talking about the concept of registered reports and really bringing any newcomers up to speed on what the format is and why we, uh, why we offer it, why it's in a, a now a, a publishing option in science. And I'm gonna stop at that point and shift on to, um, to other speakers who'll cover implementation and as David said, evaluation. So I'm just gonna introduce you to the concept of registered reports. And I think when, when we think about conceptual issues, it's important to go back to the very basics and from my point of view, uh, the motivation for registered reports stems from a rather fundamental paradox uh, in science and academia, which I think explains uh, part of the reasons why we uh, are suffering from low re reproducibility in many fields at the moment. And the paradox goes like this. If I ask an audience of scientists which part of a research study that they believe should be beyond their control as scientists, after some thinking, uh, the answer always comes back as the results, because the results are the one part of your research that, you know, if you're a good, objective, dispassionate investigator, you should try to keep at arm's length, and we shouldn't try to push results around or get certain outcomes, we should just let the universe give us the answer. But then I ask the same people, which part of a study do they believe is the most important for advancing their careers, particularly if you're an early career researcher, and you know, publishing in the high impact journals, uh, achieving uh, success in grant applications and so on, getting promoted, getting hired. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is also the results. So we're told on the one hand, if you're a good scientist, don't try and push your results around, don't touch this bit here, but at the same time, make sure your results are amazing, make sure they're positive, clean, um, convincing, compelling, uh, they tell a good story and so on. And there's no shortage of advice, you know, in the literature and in informal circles on, you know, the, the, the mastery of the message and the story and the spin that's very important for publishing, you know, in, in prestigious outlets. This paradox is, I think, at the root cause of many of the problems we face uh, in science at the moment, in particular the social and life sciences. And when we put researchers under pressure to produce great results, uh, they will do it. You, if you push the individual to do something that is in their interest, they will do it in order to have a career, but we may not like how they go about doing it. And what we've learned over the last 10 years is that, that the scientific method, uh, simplified here in terms of a deductive cycle, 
is prone to being broken at all different points from the pressure to get great, great results. And this manifests as a, a, a lack of replication, low power. So a lot of salami slicing are doing a lot of small studies rather than a smaller number of more definitive larger ones. Various forms of selective reporting, um, otherwise termed p-hacking, uh, changing a hypothesis to reinvent history and retrofit it onto outcomes that in fact are unexpected. This is the so-called practice of harking or hypothesizing after results are known. And then up here in the top left, the, the specter of publication bias, which hangs over everything and lack of data sharing. Um, and there are various reasons why these practices um, are very common. These, these questionable practices are common. And one of them, in my opinion, is because we put researchers under this relenting, unrelenting pressure to produce great results at all times for their careers. Now, it's this problem which has motivated the core essence of registered reports, that if we're, we're, we're existing in an outcome-oriented ecosystem at the moment in academia and in science, then the solution to that is to just make results a dead currency, take the value of the results out of the equation when it comes to evaluating quality. And the premise behind this is that, when, at least when we're talking about hypothesis testing and perhaps even more broadly in certain cases, when we, when we think about hypothesis testing, what, what gives a piece of research its value, its scientific value? Why, what gives it its merit? Well, we can look at the question. So how important and um, uh, insightful is the question that is being asked? How important is it for us to answer that question? How rigorous, how reliable, how innovative is the methodology that is being proposed to address that question, to answer that question. But drawing a line at that point and saying, never the result, never the result that is produced will influence the quality. The quality itself is separate from the actual outcome, okay, of the process. And this bends us all the way back to, you know, one of Richard Feynman's famous quotes that we must be very careful not to fool ourselves. We're the easiest people to fool in science uh, when we have particular uh, disposition to wanting to get certain results. You know, we all we are all human. We all want to see certain findings more than others in our research. Um, but we have to build in protective measures against that. And this is what registered reports comes from. It comes from this philosophy that if results don't contain any information about study quality, then it makes no sense for editorial decisions at journals to be based upon results. Because if you do that, all you're going to do is fall prey to bias. So we should therefore actively blind the decision process to results. And this is uh, not a new idea. This is not a new idea by any stretch. It's been around for over 50 years. Robert Rosenthal was one of the first psychologists to propose the idea in the 1960s, where he thought, you know, that to, to get around a lot of the, um, the biasing effects of, uh, of, of, of knowing results as an editor, or even trying to get certain results as an author, it's very important for, um, for journals to assess research regardless of the results based upon the procedures, based upon the theory. At this time, there was nothing implemented. It was really just a proposal buried away in a chapter, but it emerged consistently throughout the next 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in different forms, in the social sciences, in medicine, as a precursor to what eventually became clinical trial registration. We saw the discussion continue in various forms that in fact results blind evaluation or, or pre-study review is very important for addressing this kind of bias and for a long time of course nothing much happened in many fields otherwise registered reports would be, have been around for a long time but it wasn't until neuroskeptic uh, blogger really revived the discussion around the early part of 2010 11 12 uh, in light of various fraud cases and, uh, and the, uh, the classic study on false positive psychology, that we started thinking about this pre-registration in a very, very practical way in the life sciences and in the social sciences. And this discussion got revived. And then from that discussion emerged the registered reports model as we know it today. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about the implementation because I'm sure um, Anne and Savrula and maybe Courtney will even cover aspects of that as well. But just to highlight the four central pillars of the model that um, we originally launched at Cortex in 2013. The first is that researchers decide their, their question, um, their, their hypotheses, procedures, their analyses before they commence data collection. And more recently, in fact, for, for data that already exists, this can be done after data collection, but before analysis commences. And that's offered at many journals now. 
that what happens then is that part of that review process takes place before the research is conducted. So pre-study peer review of the proposed protocol. If you pass that stage of review following revision and adjustments and improvement and all the usual kind of elements that go into methodological and theoretical review of research, then uh, the, the, the work is granted in principle acceptance. Okay, so the journal says, we virtually guarantee to publish this um, you know, at stage two, provided you meet certain criteria. And this is how, this is a very simplified description of how this process works. For those who are uninitiated, there's this stage one peer review process that happens at the design stage before the research is conducted. Reviewers assess the theory, the theoretical framework, the rationale for the hypotheses, if there are hypotheses, the methodological rigor and robustness. As I say, this will, if all goes well, after review and revision, get in principle acceptance or IPA. And then at stage two, reviewers come back and after the research is done and the results are in to assess the compliance with study protocol and importantly, whether the conclusions are based upon the evidence. And this is a very different kind of review process to normal, right? So they're not assessing things like the, uh, the, the, how clean the results are or the subjective impact of the research or those types of elements that they are out of the equation, okay? All we're interested in at this point is um, judging uh, whether the research did what it was supposed to do whether quality checks were passed and whether the conclusions are based upon the evidence. And you know, a lot of the heavy lifting in the review process happens at this earlier stage, at stage one. So we don't relitigate you know, theory, rationale, and method at stage two after results are in. So the idea of this split review process is to take out, take away outcome bias from the evaluation so that we make results literally a dead currency when it comes to deciding which articles get accepted and eventually published. And as I say, none of these things matter. So when it comes to assessing a stage two registered report, it doesn't matter whether a hypothesis is supported. It doesn't matter whether results are statistically significant, whether they're novel, whether they have impact. All of these um, indicators that those of us who've been around in the academic system for a little while are very familiar with, they're completely meaningless in the context of a registered report. So it's a completely different way of thinking about and evaluating scientific research. I'm gonna zip through some of the advantages of the format as I see it. Uh, first of all, for the scientific community, this really have to be understood on a number of levels. So we can talk about three main categories of benefit um, of the format, at least theoretically. One is reproducibility. So what we find with registered reports because of the amount of detail that has to go in to the methods in order for them to be assessed properly at stage one and for reviewers to be convinced that the, the work is worth doing and will be done properly, we see method sections that are often longer and more detailed and by that very nature, more repeatable than method sections um, in regular articles. And attached to that is another requirement. A lot of journals uh, set minimum requirements on sample size, power, um, statistical sensitivity, however defined, so you often end up with larger, more definitive studies than you would get down the general track. So, you know, a registered report, it's not uncommon, for example, at Cortex, for a registered report to have a sample size that's maybe two, three, or even four times larger than normal. The second main category of benefit is transparency. So uh, there's two ways this manifests. One is the fact that for most registered report formats, open data and open materials, open digital materials, are... Uh, typically required as well at many journals, or at least strongly encouraged. So we see a lot more data sharing and a lot more sharing of the, the ingredients, crucial ingredients of the research. And there's also an interpretive transparency that becomes clear in a registered report at stage two, because in reporting the outcomes, um, authors are free to, to conduct exploratory analyses that were unregistered and were not planned. That's absolutely fine. And there's no restriction on the kinds of creativity and um, um, exploratory thinking that, that can be done. Um, but it's the main requirement is that those analyses and those outcomes are clearly distinguished from the outcomes that were based upon the pre-registered confirmatory tests that went through stage one review, which have to be reported in their entirety. So this is, there's this additional layer of in, inferential transparency between confirmatory and exploratory outcomes, which is beneficial for the reader because you can then apply the uh, level of confidence that you're happy with in each of those separate sets of results. You don't typically see this in a regular article. In a regular article, you won't know whether or not the hypotheses were, were planned in advance or invented after looking at data. You won't know whether uh, an analysis that looks like it was a hypothesis test is in, was in fact a, an a priori hypothesis test or a post hoc exploratory analysis. There's no way of distinguishing them. 
And finally, the final category of benefit um, for the community is credibility. So we're taking away various forms of bias out of the equation, provided the format works as it should. So we're taking away publication bias, which is logically impossible because the decision to publish is made before the results are known. So it's impossible for the results to influence the publication outcome. We're also doing our very best to limit hindsight bias. So this problem of harking or reinventing history to present unexpected results as though they were expected because it helps telling a good story to do so. And we also do our very best to prevent selective reporting and the confirmatory analyses because of course, authors have to specify their analysis plans. What about the individual? It's all well and good saying these are the benefits for science. Why do we do this uh, at all? Like, why? What's the benefit for you as an author in, in using this approach? It's no good, and I, you know, over the years I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. It's no good coming up with solutions for improving scientific practice that only benefit the community but carry either no benefits or even severe costs for the individual. They just don't work because they rely on altruism, and you know we can't expect anyone to sacrifice their career. For the, for the good of the cause. So we have to make sure that we align the benefits for the individuals and for the community. And this is where registered reports again really win, I think. So first real benefit is that you, as an author, you get your reviewer feedback when it's most useful before you've done the work. There's not much point getting a great, really insightful review, review from a referee about something you could have done to fix a problem in your design after you've done the study and got the results in. Um, and so it makes the review process more efficient and, and helpful to get that feedback at the point in time when it can be when it can actually be applied. And therefore the review process itself um, has a much more constructive tone. It's much, you're much more working in concert with reviewers to try and build something that's strong, robust, insightful, and hopefully impactful, rather than find reasons to gatekeep and shut stuff down and to reject papers. And the second main benefit, the one that really is the main big one, this is the big draw, is that as a researcher, you can get your paper accepted before you even start your research and regardless of how the results turn out in the end. So no more playing the p-value lottery, gambling on certain results going a certain way, otherwise you won't have your PhD or you won't get your next fellowship or your next grant. It takes all of that pointless and I think quite foolish gambling out of the equation completely. My final slide before we move on is just to give you a, a very brief overview of where the format is now, how the concept has evolved. So as David said at the outset, we have over 300 journals across a wide range of fields now offering the registered reports format. And we've seen a steady rise in adoption over the last seven years. Um, some would say this is a rapid rise. Others would say this is a slow rise. It's a very small percentage of the total number of scientific journals. But at the same time, you know, it's a new initiative and um, it's great. It's it makes people change the way they think about their workflows. So it's not it's not unexpected. I think that it's going to accumulate fairly gradually. Um, on the other side, we have there's about 600 or so fully completed registered reports that have been published. They're stage two registered reports with results. Um, so there's a there's a growing corpus which will continue to expand probably exponentially over the coming years. And the format um, most recently has expanded beyond journals um, into what, what's known as the peer community in registered reports, which is an, initi an initiative that we established in April, um, which performs stage one and stage two review of registered report preprints before they even get submitted to a journal. And we have a number of journals on board which endorse our decisions without further review or show interest in our decisions, even if they uh, will review in, in addition to our reviews. And this is another track that authors can take in, in using the format. If you want to read more about that, there's a, there's a link here to the, the peer community website. I think that's all I'll say for now. Um, I, I want to let, make sure I don't cut into anyone else's time, but my aim here has really just been to introduce you to the concept. Um, and before we move next into discussion of action, evaluation, implementation. Thank you. Chris, thank you. You're perfectly on time. I appreciate that. Um, one bit of housekeeping I didn't mention is that most questions uh, we'll, we'll hold until the end for discussion. If there are any clarifying questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we will um, you know, address it as quickly as possible. I don't see any raised hands right now. So I'm going to pass the uh, pass the screen to Stavrula to talk about the implementation of registered reports at Nature Human Behavior um, and perhaps beyond. Thank you. Thank you, David. 
and thank you very much for the invitation to participate um, on this panel. Um, so I'll try, I'll do my best not to repeat <laughs> things that Chris has just said, even though a little bit of repetition will be unavoidable. Um, I'm the chief editor of Nature Human Behavior, and I'll be talking about our experience uh, with uh, registered reports. When I took on uh, the launch of Nature Human Behavior back in 2016, um, I wanted to create a journal that aligned as closely as possible with principles of rigor and credibility. And I also wanted to redefine what constitutes a significant uh, advance, placing discovery research on an equal footing with confirmatory or disconfirmatory research, and also moving away the evaluation of research from the results, which as Chris said, are beyond researchers' control, to the research, research questions, the methods, and how substantive uh, the work is. So based on this description, it was an entirely a no-brainer to adopt uh, registered reports, which formalize um, these, these, these aims. So we adopted the format from uh, the start. In our first issue, we published an editorial uh, calling the community to submit their registered reports to us. And in our first year, in 2017, we received 28 registered reports uh, by by 2020, that number um, had more than trebled. And although um, registered reports still constitute a very small proportion of the content we receive, approximately 2 to 4 percent per year, to me, um, and as Chris noted, it's no surprise. Adopting this is a radical departure from the traditional way of doing research, and any radical departure requires culture change, and cul culture change requires time. With respect to the disciplines we've seen um, come to us, submitted to us, uh, perhaps it's no surprise, but just over uh, 50 to 50% 50 of uh, submissions over the previous four years were in psychology and 18% in neuroscience. This makes sense both in terms of where the format uh, originated, the disciplines from which it originated, and also our scope. Although we're multidisciplinary, or psychology especially forms a, a very a core component of the journal. But we have seen um, a development in, in that respect. Uh, back in 2017, nearly all of the registered reports we received were in neuroscience and psychology. In 2020, the picture had changed, although psychology and neuroscience are still the majority at 60% approximately. 40% comes from other disciplines such as political science, economics, but also genetics. And we, we've accepted in principle one uh, registered report in genetics, psychiatry, communication studies, as well as a host of other disciplines, including sociology, uh, education, public health, um, and many more. Now, the output, what, what have we produced over the uh, past four years? We have accepted in principle uh, over the previous four years, uh, 24 stage one protocols. At the point where a stage one protocol is accepted in principle, we require that authors deposit it either under embargo until stage two publication or uh, publicly at that time in a stable uh, repository. And if the authors agree, we also offer to upload the protocol on their behalf to uh, on Figshare in a specific um, space dedicated to the journal. Uh, and I've included the link here for anybody who wants to peruse the, the AIP uh, protocols um, at NHB. Out of these 24, we've published 10 stage two registered reports and we have 
quite a few coming up as well, which is great. Uh, we've collected those as well on our webpage, and I've included the link if you'd like to go through the papers we've accepted and published, now published at stage two. Um, this is a question that comes up frequently, and uh, of course, this is a very small number, 10 papers, but everybody asks about outcomes, the results. And we found out of these 10, three reported uh, positive results that supported the hypotheses, five reported null or negative uh, findings, and two were inconclusive. Now, when it comes to uh, the peer review decisions for registered reports and uh, acceptance in principle decisions for registered reports versus regular articles, um, over the previous uh, four years for regular articles, we have uh, sent out for peer review 14% of the papers we received. Um, the remaining 86% uh, were rejected editorially. For registered reports, that proportion is 21%, uh, and registered reports are 50% more likely to be sent out for review than regular articles. Um, this uh, is also true, these are the aggregate data for the four years, but this is also true if you look at uh, year on year, the data for each individual year, every year, regardless of fluctuations in overall uh, out to review rates, um, registered reports uh, are approximately 50% more likely to be sent out to review. Um, we have sent out to review over four years approximately 50% 50, percent, 50 uh, of stay, um, uh, regist stage one registered reports, so our corpus is small, but looking at that corpus, 43% received acceptance in principle uh, as compared to 37% uh, for regular articles. So what have we learned? What have we learned uh, as editors? Um, back when um, we were launching Nature Human Behaviour, there was no other highly selected journal that uh, had adopted the format. And in fact, there were quite a few voices saying, oh, this is going to be just for um, non-selective journals, journals that don't select on impact. That is not true. Uh, you select, you can select for impact, but not on the wrong principles, not on the results but on the basis of the methods, the importance of the question, your audience and um, the criteria that you have for defining importance, so long as you leave re the results out of the question. Um, as for authors, we also needed to learn. This, this is a different, a different way of approaching editing um, papers. And also because of the low volume, they are a, a very small proportion of the papers we see day to day. Um, so especially at that time when there were uh, far fewer journals around, um, the learning process for us was perhaps a bit steeper, but we had a lot of help. Uh, Chris, um, who is an advisor on, uh, on the journal, was extremely generous with his time and uh, with his engagement and also provided us with materials, template materials that we could modify to fit our, uh, our goals. Um, in the meantime, registered reports have grown substantially and the, the community of editors, uh, those of us who offer the format on our journals has also grown substantially. So currently there is even more help and I'm sure I'm not uh, speaking just on, on my behalf, but there are a lot of editors um, in the community who would be very happy to help anybody in the audience who's interested, who's an editor interested in adopting the format. Registered reports also involve some additional work. This is partly by um, default in the sense that registered reports require a minimum of two rounds of peer review, one before um, data collection for uh, making a decision on acceptance in principle and one after. For regular articles, the minimum uh, number of peer review rounds is um, one. We see that translated in practice as well. The um, uh, median rounds of peer review at Nature Human Behaviour for registered reports after stage two is three versus two for regular articles. 
but we have much greater engagement in the work. So um, it's very different when you receive something that is all done and something where you can actually help work with the authors and the reviewers to make it as good as it is, as, it, as, as possible, um, for the authors then to move on to um, complete their project. And that's really satisfying for an editor, from an editor's point of view. At the same time, this comes with greater moral responsibility. And um, what I mean by that is um, when you get an article where everything's been done, your role as an editor is to ensure that uh, you vet it appropriately, but you have no contribution to its quality or how the, uh, the author's effort and time and money were invested. When it comes to register reports, you do have that responsibility. That responsibility is greater because the authors haven't spent the money, the time and the effort to go off and do the research. So there is a very uh, a higher element of responsibility as an editor when you uh, handle registered reports. But to me, that greater responsibility is actually a very positive thing. That's with registered reports, I feel we are actually making a much more important contribution to science and the scientific community. So I, I wouldn't count it as a, as a job, but quite the contrary. Regardless of how you see uh, the process, what I feel that um, makes the greatest difference, and I'm a huge supporter after five years of working on registered reports of the adoption of the format is the reward when something is ultimately published um, at stage two because you see something that as an editor you have near 100 percent certainty that it's rigorous and credible to me that makes my day <laughs> so i think that's the for me the most important driver what have we learned from the author's perspective that at Nature Human Behavior, at least, and I wouldn't be surprised if that holds at other journals as well, the chance of having your stage one registered report peer reviewed, and hence, because more go out to peer review, also more are um, AIP'd, is greater than for uh, regular articles. From our authors who have undergone the registered report process, uh, we've been receiving very positive feedback. F people are very happy to work with a format. Um, Chris summarized a lot of uh, other points that are really important for uh, science and for authors. One underappreciated aspect, I believe, of registered reports is that they are, I think, one of the best training uh, in rigorous science tools available out there. You learn how to uh, draw a firm distinction between exploratory and confirmatory research, which in my experience as an editor is very hazy <laughs> at best um, in, in the regular uh, published literature. Um, you learn to be very, very specific and clear about what your hypotheses are and to state them in a way that they are testable and to derive clear predictions from them. You learn how to build direct links between your hypotheses and predictions and your analysis plan. You learn robust sampling methods. Uh, and of course, there are no incentives for questionable research practices. There is no reason, the decision is not made on the results. There's no reason to engage in harking, p hacking, and you can't actually do it. So uh, to help authors build robust protocols, we've created a template. It's very detailed. It's based, of course, on uh, our criteria, but it's free for anybody to adopt who's, who's interested in it. Uh, there are two aspects that I don't believe are yet fully appreciated. The value of pilot data or simulations with dummy data before um, as part of the stage one protocol. And I need to be entirely clear, the reason why I would encourage all registered reports authors, except those who do replications, to um, consider piloting their study or doing uh, simulations with uh, dummy data is because um, you, not because we want to know what the re, to have a preview of what the potential re, results are. That's beyond the point. What is the point is registered reports, perhaps more than other research article, 
require a greater investment of time and effort because of the requirements all journals have for power. Although we differ, uh, we ask for um, studies to be powered at 95% or uh, base factors equal 10 or one tenth. Others set a, the, the limit at 90% power, others at 80%, but still, no matter what the power requirements are, that is a much higher standard than your average article. So you will need to invest more time and more money to be able to um, to do your registered report. Before you throw all that time and effort and money, it's really good to make sure that you do everything you can in collaboration with the reviewers and the editor to make sure that you've optimized your design to study the question that you're interested in. And another aspect that's perhaps not sufficiently appreciated, and perhaps that's a personal take, is the value of adopting, of opting for Bayesian sampling methods rather than null hypothesis significance testing and power analyses uh, for your sampling. With power analyses, you need to meet a certain power level depending on the journal, and you have to commit to a specific number of participants or samples that meet that requirement. And there's no there is no movement. It's not negotiable. That's it. You stick to you. You have to do to collect those data. You can't peak and you can't stop. With Bayesian sampling methods, especially um, when you are using base factors and the journal sets a level of evidentiary, um, uh, the evidentiary level required, you can set a maximum number of participants, but if you meet the level of evidentiary uh, support required, you can stop testing. This means that you can save resources. It doesn't work out. It won't work out every time like this. Nonetheless, it's a, probably a more efficient way of using your time, your money, your resources, but also more consonant with um, like treating participants. Um, when they participate in research, they want to do it because it helps science. If there is a level of participation that may, may be superfluous, that's good to take, take on board. Um, sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm moving back and forth. So my um, take home message would be if you're an editor in the audience and you are thinking whether it would be a good idea to adopt registered reports, by all means do. Um, I, uh, I believe that uh, there are benefits to for every party involved and especially because you get to actually play a more active uh, role uh, in your uh, capacity as an editor in making sure that the work you do makes a difference. If you're a researcher, Chris summarized some of the benefits, I summarized some of the benefits, I'd say you get the best training available, one shot training available uh, with doing registered reports and at the end of the day you can publish your work much, much you, you are guaranteed to publish your work if you received uh, AIP and you, you play by the rules at stage two. Uh, for reviewers, um, again, there is um, much more active engagement. You make a difference um, in a much more positive way. It's very different. It's quite disappointing for a lot of reviewers. They accept to review because they read a really interesting abstract. They're excited about the work. They start reading uh, all good until you get to the methods and you see, gosh, this is definitely not working. They're not answering the question they posed or the design is flawed. And all you can do is say, sorry, go back to the drawing board. That's really not satisfying. Um, and that's not what happens with registered reports. For funders, Registered reports are an investment. It's a good investment of funding money. And um, it's important for uh, funders to support the initiative uh, as it develops as well. And finally, as for every initiative, um, we need to evaluate it and to evaluate it continuously and also to optimize it as it develops. And that's where the role of meta scientists is really important.
So that's it from me and I'll hand back to David. Thank you so much, Chevrola. There's a great um, queue of questions coming through and, and, and we're getting through those sort of in typing. Two questions came up that spoke to uh, a, a point you made right at the end. So I just wanted to uh, make sure to uh, give the opportunity for, for you and Chris to also um, emphasize any points or feedback you've heard from the reviewers. Uh, Tamarinde and another asked, what, what's, what's your feedback been from reviewers who have been in, involved in this uh, format so far? Um, do, do either one of you want to uh, elaborate on that point at all? Sure, perhaps. Um, Chris, would you like to uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about that? I can also chip in. Sorry, I actually missed that because I was reading one of the questions in the Q&A. <laughs> Could you repeat, David? Sorry. I'll read that. Yeah, um, two questions, but I'll, I'll just read Tamarindes here. What has it been your feedback from reviewers that have reviewed registered reports? Um, and, and how do you acknowledge their contributions or what feedback have you heard from them? Um, no, it's a good question. So, well, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. So uh, pretty much all positive. Um, you don't get a huge amount of feedback from reviewers because reviewers are so busy. So you like you, you don't hear from reviewers every time. Um, but when you do hear from them, it's almost always to say how interesting that process was or different, or they felt it was more constructive. I always remember one of the first um, uh, comments we had from a reviewer back in the early days of Cortex. He, he wrote in after the whole stage one process had finished and he was like, this, I've never done anything like this because I feel like I can actually help them avoid problems. It's not even like grant review because you can't, you can't help people in a grant review. You're just gatekeeping. Uh, there's this, the, the, the interactive dialogue of the review process he felt was really useful. Um, occasionally you get negative comments. I've had a couple of reviewers uh, not understand the process. Like they, they get annoyed by the lack of results or they don't quite, you know, maybe they don't read the invitation letter. Um, usually if I explain a little bit more about what it involves, um, they, they get it. But occasionally there's just, there can be misunderstandings. Um, but broadly, I think reviewers have responded very positively. I guess on the question of like rewards and incentives, there have been proposals to give re reviewers more formal recognition um, when it comes to reviewing registered reports at stage one, because they are in potentially influencing matters of design and theory and you know issues for which you might think authorship would, would, would be on the table. I have had cases where reviewers have become authors. They've had to, of course, stop being reviewers. You can't be both. There are problems when you start formalizing, I think, rewards based upon reviews of registered reports if those rewards depend upon the registered reports getting accepted, because you could then incentivize kind of soft reviewing um, that's not as insightful because if somebody gets something out of it. So I think you do have to be very, you have to be handled, it has to be handled delicately and carefully, but I, there is potential, I think, to build on it. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, now I'm going to pass it off to Anne Scheel. If you're just coming in, um, Anne Scheel is a uh, doctoral candidate at the uh, Polytech Institute at uh, Adenhaven in the Netherlands, studying meta science and reproducible research practices there. And you're going to talk about some evaluations that have occurred um, that you've um, led in um, directly on the register report format. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to Anne. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm just trying to set the screen share. Um, one second. Yes. All right, does that work? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, all right, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, David. So, um, uh, yeah, as you've heard, my part here is to um, tell you a little something about uh, evaluating registered reports and some research that I've done myself on this, and in particular on the questions, do registered reports reduce publication bias? And uh, as uh, you've heard in the, if you've been here for the, uh, for the whole um, session, you've heard uh, one answer to this in the beginning when Chris said that they do this by default, in, <laughs> basically, not logically. I will, I will get back to that point. Um, but first, yeah, first uh, start with publication bias as a, um, a, a working definition of this uh, that I use um, is publication bias is basically selective publication of positive results. Um, and this can happen uh, in at least two different ways. One I call reviewer bias. So that would be if authors um, submit both positive and negative results to journals, but reviewers and or editors prefer positive results or are more critical of negative results, 
So negative results end up getting rejected more often than positive results. This is one way in which bias essentially would come in and we would select for positive results. Um, the other mechanism is file drawing. So that's from the author side who would um, decide to not even submit negative results to publication or not even bother writing them up. Um, and uh, I think it's quite, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite intuitive to think that these two processes might be related. So authors might uh, be dis, uh, disincentivized to submit negative results because they anticipate reviewer bias and they think it's not worth the effort, but there could also be different um, aspects to it. Um, we have some evidence for publication bias in psychology and the social sciences, which is where I come from. Um, one is indirect evidence, in particular in psychology, um, that is an implausibly high success rate. So if we look at the published literature, we typically find an extremely large amount of studies has positive results. Um, mostly, most studies that have looked into this at all report rates of, um, above 90%. So 90% of published articles have positive results. Um, and this is strange because we also have relatively good data on statistical power in psychology, which is, does not look as good. And um, as you probably know, statistical power is essentially the um, probability of detecting an effect if it exists. Um, which is, um, as uh, several studies have suggested, on average, um, studies in psychology tend to have less than 50% power for medium-sized effects. Um, so this would mean that uh, it's basically impossible to reach that 90% of positive results unless all hypotheses psychologists are study psychologists study are true uh, and have large effects that they can detect with their small samples. Um, so this sounds uh, not very plausible. Um, the other part is we also have some direct evidence of publication bias uh, in recent years, most notably two studies by Franco, Melcher, and Simonovitz, who looked at a grant, pub, uh, a grant program and have some longitudinal data of um, uh, studies, basically a full pop, uh, population of conducted studies, um, and followed them over time to see which of the studies end up getting written up and published. Um, and here they also find that null results uh, are mostly not published and a lot of them not even written up for publication, whereas uh, studies with strong results were overwhelmingly written up and also published. Um, so this is exactly this uh, publication bias effect that we would expect. All right, um, so now um, as we've been talking, as, as, as Chris has explained in the first session, registered reports are essentially designed to reduce publication bias. Um, so the whole process is um, a structure such that the decision whether to accept or reject a, a, an article is made before the results are known. So taking the results completely out of the equation. Um, so at stage one, um, before uh, stage one, an article or proposal is uh, reviewed and gets in principle acceptance before the data are in, or at least before the data are analyzed. Um, and in the second stage at stage two, when the second round of peer review, articles can only be rejected if the authors um, substantially deviated from the protocol or if important quality checks were failed, but not for the main results of the paper. All right, so um, one question is, does that work as intended essentially? And um, in particular, so that would mean we would expect that registered reports don't show this implausibly high success rate that we know in the general literature. Um, and my colleagues and I ran, a study, ran one study on this, which is now published in Advances in Methods um, and, pra and Practices in Psychological Science. Um, and our goal here was basically just to compare the positive result rate. So that is the proportion of, our, of articles that have positive results um, in registered reports to normal papers, which you hear called standard reports. And we did this in the discipline of psychology because that's um, where we have the most expertise to evaluate those papers. Um, the way we did this was um, we had two samples. So our registered report sample is actually um, basically the full population of registered reports at the time. Um, I should say registered reports limited to the discipline psychology. Um, and uh, we also uh, excluded registered reports that did uh, explicitly not test the hypothesis. Um, in the end, that was at the time we started the analysis, that was late 2018, that was only 71 papers that we ended up with. Uh, I have to admit it was a little bit disappointing at the time because we started with a database of 150 um, and that ended up not being uh, as many. I think this is definitely an analysis that I would like to 
uh, repeat sometime in the future because you've already heard that there are many more published registered reports now already. Um, we compared this to a sample of standard reports, um, which we um, randomly sampled from the literature from a time to in a time frame matched um, to the time in which registered reports have existed. Um, and we again only included articles that tested hypothesis. We selected them through the, the search phrase test the hypothesis, um, which um, was like if they had this in the abstract or in the keywords or some, uh, yeah, in, in the abstract mostly. Um, they would be included, and then we drew a random sample of 150, uh, of a sample a little bit, so ended up with 152. Um, and um, what we did then, we basically measured uh, positive results by extracting the first hypothesis um, mentioned in a paper, um, either mentioned in the abstract, or if it was not clear enough in the abstract, we went to the full text um, to see more clearly, and then coded whether the authors reported that hypothesis to be supported or not supported. And um, what's important here uh, is that uh, partial support was coded as positive results. So full or partial support counts as a positive result, not supported, no support is uh, counted as negative result. Um, and we also coded whether, oh yeah, and I should say we double coded this, um, coding was not blind, which is certainly a limitation. Um, we decided that it would have been very difficult to remove all mentions of a registered report in our sample, um, but that is definitely a potential source of bias. Um, we also coded whether studies were original studies or replication studies, um, and this is important because registered reports have, uh, or we know that registered reports are very popular for replication studies in psychology, at least for the early adopters, um, I would say. And so we expected a lot of the registered reports to be replication studies, and very few normal papers to replication studies. And we have some reason to, to uh, uh, think that re replication studies are more often negative. They might be conducted because authors are skeptical of the original study, for example. Um, and so that might influence the results. Um, we also, this I won't go into, uh, I don't have the time to go into this, but I'm happy to answer questions about this later. In registered reports, we also looked at how the um, hypotheses were described or introduced. And that is because, as I just mentioned, we selected the comparison papers, the normal papers, based on this phrase, test the hypothesis, and the registered reports were not selected this way. And since we don't know how um, representative this phrase is for hypothesis testing papers in general, we looked at how what language was used in registered reports for this um, as an exploratory analysis. All right, uh, I should say that our way of um, uh, sampling uh, standard reports and the way of coding positive results was a direct replication of a um, study done by Daniele Fanelli in 2010. It was quite influential. Um, he sampled 150 papers from several disciplines and compared the positive result rate um, across them. And he had this result that uh, psychology had the highest positive result rate of all, so we're the, uh, the black sheep. Um, so we took his exact method and applied it in this new context. Um, all right, so now the results might already be familiar to some. Um, we see uh, here on the left, the standard reports um, have a very high positive result rate as we would expect as we've seen in other studies before. Um, so this is 96% um, positive results in the normal literature and psychology compared to in registered reports only 43-44% um, positive results. So a huge drop. Um, what I find interesting here, yeah, that the the rate we find for the general literature is really so consistent with uh, what we've seen before, above 90%. Um, and that registered reports are really so much lower, it even surprised me, I have to admit. Um, we also analyzed, as I mentioned before, original uh, if studies were original or replication studies. And as I mentioned, that is because we su su uh, suspected that red, uh, replication studies might have more negative results. And so here you see it split only original studies versus only replication studies on the right. And um, you see that the general pattern holds for, for original studies only. But you also see that a lot of registered reports indeed were replication studies. So more than half of our sample in registered reports, oh, sorry, were replication studies. And um, if we only focus on original studies, and we see that the positive result rate in registered reports was slightly higher, was 50% but still way lower than the extremely, again, extremely high positive result rate in the general literature. And um, for application studies, 
yeah, the positive result rate of registered report was, reports was a bit lower, 39%, uh, compared to the four, star, four standard reports we found that were replication studies, four small studies, they were all positive, which I also find a little um, ironic, actually, that in the standard literature, we find basically the opposite effect, that the replication studies were more positive. But yeah, this is, of course, a tiny sample, so uh, who knows if this would hold up. Um, okay, I should also say there was another um, study similar to ours. It came out earlier by uh, Chris Allen and David Mela in 2019. Um, they, they audited um, uh, registered reports that had been published at the time in psychology and biomedicine, um, and uh, look, also looked at uh, how many hypotheses were, uh, were positive. The method is a little different from ours, but they generally came arrived at the same or well, very similar conclusion. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to directly compare their coding to ours because we coded the full um, hypotheses that we evaluated um, in their data set. We don't know exactly which they were, so we can't directly compare them. Um, but still, I think it's good to see that we're not very far apart, so they have around 40% positive results, whereas we have around 43, 44% total. All right, um, conclusion. Um, so what we see, registered reports have dramatically fewer positive results um, than uh, regular studies. Um, but we cannot establish causality in the study. This was only an observational study. Um, in particular, things that are confounds that are possible are that Authors who choose to uh, submit registered reports, especially in this very early cohort, they might, be, they might be systematically different from authors who don't do this. They might be less biased or more prone to submitting negative results anyway. Um, and one thing that I find uh, quite interesting uh, is that registered reports might be used strategically for risky hypotheses that authors expect to get to um, provide negative results for in which they anticipate could be difficult to publish as regular articles. And if that is true, we basically have a different base rate of true hypotheses in the registered report literature and the standard literature. Um, and this would, this would influence the results that we, um, that we should expect. But we can still say that the standard literature has way too many positive results. So it is really uh, very, very difficult to explain these numbers um, without assuming bias. Um, and so, yeah, in my own research, I'm um, next steps are, or one of the things I'm interested in is um, especially looking into this idea that uh, red, what happens if registered reports are used for more risky hypotheses or um, what that might do to uh, the things that we actually uh, end up, uh, the, 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 the questions that researchers um, study. Um, all right, so then to sum up, do registered reports reduce publication bias? Uh, again, as I said, as Chris has already answered it, essentially registered reports are designed to reduce publication bias. So essentially, if the procedure is followed as intended, there is no way that um, articles can be selected based on the results. Um, so I think part of this question is not empirical. Um, but to the extent that it is, I think what's also important here is to, that we should verify the implementation of registered reports to see how well is the um, procedure followed, what are the cracks through which bias could creep in, um, do the editors and reviewers and also the authors actually do as they should. Um, and the other question that, as I just mentioned, that I'm also very interested in is to monitor uh, the, uh, the incent, the, the consequences of change of the change incentives. So as Chris mentioned in the beginning, registered reports are set up to, um, yeah, to change the incentives so that bias isn't even, the publication bias isn't desirable anymore. But I think that the way in which the incentives are changed might also have consequences that we don't completely foresee. And I, I'm, I think it's very interesting to look into that and see if this really gets us where we want to go in general and that there are no um, unattended side effects. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for that. And I look forward to uh, you zooming in on those, you know, ruling out some of the alternative explanations or especially kind of, I, I think there's a lot of interest and a lot of discussion that will happen sort of monitoring how to change incentives, um, what the consequences, perhaps sometimes unintended consequences of, of 
those might be. So um, I eagerly anticipate the future there. Thank you. And now, last but not least, Courtney Soderberg, who will be presenting on some of uh, additional evaluation of how reviewers were uh, considering register reports compared to comparable studies. Um, Courtney, hand it off to you. All right. Uh... Hello, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, a research study that I and some of my former colleagues on the MetaScience team uh, worked on while I was still at COS, um, which was looking to evaluate how registered, registered reports compare um, to the traditional publication model. Um, so you know, uh, Chris and others have talked a lot about the proposed benefits of registered reports. I'm not going to belabor this fact. Um, but you know, in theory, if they're working as intended, they should be minimizing publication bias, improving rigor, improving the importance of the research questions that are asked. Um, but as Ann mentioned, whether registered reports are implemented in a way that actually leads to that um, is a question that we can test. And along with the proposed benefits of registered reports, um, some registered report skeptics came out with also some potential costs of registered reports, um, which were they may, they may lead to less creative research, less innovative research, or less interesting papers. Um, and some of the logic behind this goes that, you know, registered reports, as we've heard, require kind of a lot of upfront knowledge and upfront planning because you have to provide, you know, exactly what analyses you're going to do. Um, you have to have a really good idea of effect sizes so you can properly power and things like that, which may not be harder to get um, if you're kind of doing research that is really moving into a new field or new direction where um, there may be less information. Um, additionally, you know, it might be easier to do registered reports if you're doing like really small incremental work. And so maybe people are um, just not going to try and submit really uh, interesting novel papers to registered reports because they don't feel like it's possible. Um, you know, these are not what is supposed to be happening with registered reports, but uh, people have, you know, offered these up as potential costs. And it's important that with any intervention, we actually check is it having the benefits it's supposed to have without having unintended negative consequences. So we set out to test, do registered reports increase the quality of research without stifling innovation? So do they have uh, the benefits without incurring costs? Um, there are different ways of measuring quality and innovation, right? There's no kind of canonical uh, scale or measure for this. Um, so we actually took two slightly different approaches. We did some factual coding of information, which I'm not really going to get into today. Um, and we also did subjective assessments. Um, so if you think about what researchers are asked to do during a review process, whether it be an article or a grant, a lot of times they're specifically asked to review a paper in terms of its quality, its rigor, its innovativeness, how impactful you think this is gonna be. Um, so this is something that researchers are asked to do a lot. And so we actually leveraged that sort of reviewer mindset um, to have people provide subjective assessments. So the way we designed the study, it was a quasi-experimental observational study. So we had um, participants read an actual pair of published articles um, in their subject area of expertise. Um, and subject area of expertise was assigned based on the self-reported um, area of the researcher and based on um, their choice of some keywords um, that best fit their research. Um, and so the actual participants were 353 psychology and neuroscience researchers. These are primarily US faculty members that we did have some grad students and some international researchers. And they were reading actual published articles. Um, so they were, these were either registered reports or non-registered reports that had been published in journals between 2014 and 2018. Um, and they rated these different articles on about 19 different outcome measures. Um, so some example questions, um, they were always asked to compare to the average study um, in their area. How novel is the research question of the study? How creative is the methodology of the study? How rigorous is the analysis strategy? How justified are the conclusions based on the paper's results? 
So I mentioned that everybody did rated two pairs of articles, a registered report and a non-registered report. Um, because these were studies that actually occurred in the literature, um, we get quite a bit of ecological validity, right? These actually look like the types of studies that get published, registered report and non-registered report. Um, but that does mean that there was a self-selection process that happened, right? Articles, well, researchers select articles into uh, going down the registered report pipeline or the non-registered report pipeline. And because of the self-selection that happens, that could bias our estimation of the treatment effect, in this case, whether something is a registered report or not. And so to try and really get at what the effect of being a registered report was on these perceptions of quality and innovativeness of a paper, what we decided to do was try to create matched pairs of articles. So a registered report would be matched with a non-registered report where we tried to make the articles as com as similar as possible um, on everything that isn't wrapped around that registered reportness of the paper. Um, and so we did this using two different matching frameworks. One was a journal first matching framework. Um, and so that emphasizes kind of what sort of publication selection criteria a journal has, right? Maybe some journals publish drier research than others, or some journals require longer papers than others. So a journal match is going to try and kind of smooth out all of those differences between the registered report and the non-registered report. Um, and then there was an author match version. And this really emphasizes um, writing and research styles, right? Maybe some authors just write really boring papers, regardless of whether they're registered report or not, and other authors are just better at making their research sound really cutting edge novel. Um, or maybe some researchers just tend to power their studies more highly than other researchers. So that author match is gonna try and smooth out those differences. Um, I should also mention that only novel research, non-replication articles were used um, for this study. And that was to allow that matching to happen. Um, at the point we did this, um, there were very few non-registered report replication studies that were published. I think uh, in Ant Sample, it was, what, four? Um, and so if, for example, we saw that registered reports were seen as a lot less novel, but most of the registered reports were replications and most of the non-registered reports weren't replications, then a very easy explanation is, well, you're comparing registered reports and non-registered reports, but you're also comparing replications and non-replications. Um, so to make a better apples to apples comparison, we only included novel research for both registered reports and their matched non-registered report articles. Um, so Within 2014 to 2018, um, articles that were published, uh, novel research, we ended up with 29 registered reports, which was nearly all of them that fit that criteria at that point. I think there was like three in poli sci that we kicked out, um, just because that would have added a complexity um, to the study. Um, so we ended up with 29 article pairs. So 29 registered reports, and then each of those registered reports had a journal and an author matched article. Um, and these were all in psychology and neuroscience, just because um, that's kind of where registered reports really got its start. So before I actually show you the results, um, I wanna kind of give you a little bit of an orientation to what I'm about to show you. Um, so because there was that matching framework, um, in order to estimate the treatment effect, what you're going to be seeing is basically the average of different scores. So for each pair of articles, we calculated the difference between that article and its matched article. And then we averaged those differences for the article pairs um, to take that matching into account. And then our analysis strategy was a Bayesian mixed effects model. Um, so I'm going to be showing you posterior distributions um, with credible intervals. And then we have the 19 outcomes, and they're broken up by when somebody saw them. So when we presented these articles to folks, we broke them up a little bit. Um, so they answered a number of questions after reading the intro and the methods, but before they saw the results. They answered another slew of questions um, after they had read the results. And then they read a final section of questions um, once they had finished the whole paper and read the abstract. Um, I should also say that 
um, we took out the word registered report from the registered report. So we did like a slight bit of redacting to the articles. We didn't go crazy um, because if you if we tried to redact them too much, they started looking like Frankenstein papers. Uh, but we did take out any obvious, like this is a registered report type of language. All right, so what did we find? So we saw that reviewers perceived registered registered reports to be more rigorous, um, provide more learnings, and be of higher quality than matched non-registered reports. And you can tell that because you see this uh, quite large shift to the right in the posteriors. Um, more positive uh, numbers mean the registered report was favored over the non-registered report paired article. Um, so we are seeing good evidence that registered reports, at least under people's perceptions, have the positive results uh, they should be having. And then there's this question of what are the perceptions of those uh, potential cons? So we do not see evidence for registered reports decreasing per perceived creativity, novelty, or importance of research. Um, and this is pretty consistent whether people are kind of being asked before or after um, they see the results. Um, now, those effects do tend to be smaller. They do tend more towards the zero point, which would be registered reports and non-registered reports are the same, um, as compared to some of the other outcome measures where we see this stronger pro-registered report bias um, or pro-registered report leading. Um, so they don't really, we don't see evidence for a registered report advantage for those, but we also don't see evidence for a non-registered report advantage. So a registered report decrement, which is really what we were trying to show. We wanna make sure that re registered reports aren't hurting these areas. Um, and we don't see strong evidence for that. So in terms of areas of future research, um, I definitely like to call this study initial evidence just because it, you know, it's an observational study. It's very psych neuroscience focused. Um, it's very much what registered reports looked like when they were first being implemented, right? It was in that 2014 to 2018 range. Um, and it is perceptual. Um, so I think going forward, I would love to see studies that actually look at do those perceptions of greater quality and rigor actually map onto um, less perceptual and more tangible um, measures of quality and rigor. Um, so for example, um, one thing that, that people have kind of posited but hasn't been tested yet are is that if registered reports are working as they should, they should be more likely to reproduce or replicate. And I think that's an open question um, that I would love to see somebody look at. Um, you know, the big pie in the sky is to do a randomized uh, a trial so you can actually uh, get that causal impact of registered reports. I think it's probably hard to pull off, but I would love to see somebody do it. Um, and then I think actually a really important point um, for all of this, which Anne mentioned as well, is these projects were looking at papers kind of closer to the heart of when this implementation happened, both in time, but also in um, discipline. And as Chris has shown um, in his first slide, you know, there's kind of been an exponential rise in the number of registered reports happening in the journals offering them in what sort of disciplines they're taking place in. And so interventions, there can be some intervention creep as interventions get further distant in time um, and or you know, in space from where they're originally implemented. And so I do think it's important to see if these effects uh, tend to hold um, for studies that, you know, maybe happened later, um, but also in other disciplines that are maybe further removed from the registered report starting point. Um, you might think that the implementation might be less, you know, valid to the original. Um, and so you might see these effects decrease, but at the same time, um, now that there's this bigger community of support around registered reports for editors and for journals, you might say, well, it's actually easier to do kind of uh, really good faith registered report implementations now. Um, so I would love to see more work in that area as registered reports move forward. All right, and that is all. 
first join me in thanking all of our panelists for presenting today. I'm going to take the um, moderator's prerogative, so to speak, and, and get some questions rolling. We have a few more minutes for, for questions. Um, Courtney, thank you so much for providing that sort of overview of, of that study. That's a real neat way to kind of evaluate a lot of those questions that have perennially arisen about retro reports. And these are just going to be so, so boring that nobody wants to, to read them or anything like that. So taking a, a look at some of those questions uh, with reviewer feedback has been really interesting to see. Um, a question for the panel at large, uh, Courtney, you sort of mentioned with kind of what, what you think some of your future directions uh, might be. Uh, so you and, and Anne, what do you think um, future areas of, of research hold? And, and you mentioned that um, you're, you're sort of interested in how rich reports might be changing incentives and or, or um, looking into that. And I'm wondering if there's um, areas there that you're you know, particularly curious about or think deserve additional insight. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, first, by the way, can you change my uh, start my video again? Because I can't switch on my camera anymore for some reason. <laughs> yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Perfect. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, as I as I hinted at a bit in my the end of my uh, presentation, so I'm I'm quite curious about um, whether registered reports encourage um, authors to change to uh, study different research questions, and this could be in the sense of studying different hypotheses with a different prior probability of being true. It's one way, but it could also be different research questions in another way. And th that might be a good thing. That might be something that we actually want. And I mean, part of this is almost um, implied and also what Chris and, and Savula uh, talked about that it's, uh, you have to do more work up front. You have to be more clear and you have to define your research question differently than in other, uh, than in, in, in normal articles. And so, kind of by definition that changes the research question, but I, I wonder how, what we can expect to happen and uh, how that might impact the, the science at large. And so I'm, I'm currently um, working on this a little bit in with uh, formal models and with simulation models basically, and, and trying to think about, well, what are the incentives? And so how would uh, researchers who respond to incentives in science kind of change the behavior and response to this? Anything to add to that, Courtney, or? So I think one thing I've always wondered, um, I saw somebody have this question and I know a group at um, Bath is working on this, but I don't remember where they are at this point. Um, you know, registered reports, the, the peer review happens before either data is collected or data is analyzed. So like the peer reviewer can have a much larger effect on the study design or the analysis strategy or something like that. Um, and somebody asked, you know, couldn't you just do this with a normal study and just blind people to the results? And I think a group at Bath is actually looking at um, an implementation at a journal where you do that. Um, and so I think one of the one of the questions that is that going to work hinges on is what exactly is it about registered reports that is having the largest impact on various pieces? Um, you know, one thing the registered reports has over that sort of model is that the reviewers can actually help you change the research design, whereas in the research has already happened, you're just blind to results, that can't happen. Um, and so I think as people kind of come up with different iterations on not quite a registered report, but not quite the the traditional model that are kind of middle grounds, understanding kind of what pieces and parts affect what part of that quality and rigor advantage will be important to know to figure out kind of like what pieces are needed for which parts. Um, yeah, the uh, Stavrula, this question I, I suspect always comes to you, and I'm not going to uh, force you to get it. <laughs> it did come through the chat. Everyone, I think, always asks you what other um, what other journals at Nature are sort of considering that, mm -hmm. and, and I won't force you to uh, uh, <laughs> you know d divulge anything that's in confidence. But I'm wondering how these conversations go um, with colleagues, with other editors. Uh, um, what, what, what types of recommendations you provide when you folks mm -hmm. approach you about 
um, ex expanding the format into other disciplines, other types of journals, et cetera? Uh, I, I pester everybody about yeah. <laughs> the <report. laughs> um, uh, Nature Communications also launched the format, adopted the format last year, scientific reports as well. Um, it's being trialed in a third journal but hasn't been announced, uh, who have started trialing um, um, handling uh, the first few submissions before going fully live and uh, it's either in the works so towards adoption in some journals or being considered in some journals. I'd say that uh, not in the physical sciences so as you know half of the nature journals are in the physical sciences and that there is less need in those fields to adopt the format, so it's not it's not something that uh, would provide the benefit that it does uh, for the life sciences and social sciences journals. But watch this space; there's more coming. Yeah, and and uh, um, uh, follow up on that, I think came from Veronique in the chat um, in the Q and A, um, pointing to an NIH report recently that is looking at the um, perceptions of. Uh, registered reports in particular, but but pre-registration more largely, I think, um, with researchers who, who use um, animal models, and there's a lot of a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding, not knowing uh, you know what these processes are necessarily. Um, I wonder if anybody on the panel has kind of recommendations for how, in this case, I think the specific recommendation would be for what funders and, and other publishers can do to raise awareness. Um, what what bits of confusion <laughs> you might have encountered uh, in your various uh, in your various lives that could be opportunities for education or or, or clarification. I think that something that comes up, uh, disciplines differ very much um, to in the extent to which uh, a research project uh, is composed of steps that one builds on top of the other versus you can plan everything in advance and you go forth and do it. So psychology and neuroscience are like the latter, as is clinical, um, clinical research. Uh, so clinical trials are fully planned in advance, very rigorous protocols for any interim analysis or any changes. So this, uh, this would work well uh, and very straightforwardly. In other disciplines, in, in some of the life sciences, every step you take, experimental step um, may depend on the previous steps you took that makes the process more complicated. We have peer-reviewed registered reports where there were a series of five studies that each had to build on top of each other and yeah. what was done in those cases was to specify the dependencies. The second way of addressing that problem is with incremental registration. Clearly, we would need to optimize the process for incremental registration, having authors wait for a very long time before they take their next step. Clearly, we want this to be an efficient process. So that's something we need to focus on and how to make sure that incremental registration is something that can happen really easily and quickly and reviewers are on board from the outset and they know what the expectations are and quick turnarounds. I believe that there are solutions, but um, I have heard several times I work for psychology or it might work for a clinical trial but it doesn't work in cell biology and it doesn't work in cancer research so i think that there are way we, we just need to think harder and work with the communities that do the research to find the best way that the model could be applied for those projects that are confirmatory i believe that exploratory research if it's bound in that way um it's it's not, it doesn't give any benefit. If it's confirmatory, if you have a hypothesis and you want to test it, then register reports can be for you, for your discipline. We just need to figure out how to do that best. Yeah, and I think that alludes to some of the other incentives that um, Anne was mentioning a little bit before. Um, sometimes there's this tension between our, you know, our rich reports just um, uh, reconfirming a love affair that we have with hypothesis tests that might be unfounded. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it, the, um, 
you know, if one thinks the hypothesis tests are the, are the right way to go about you know, a particular research program, this can be a, a, an appropriate way to, to move forward with it. Um, but that premise is not always, of course, true. And yeah, I, I think a, a big unanswered question is what's the appropriate proportion? What should a, a very healthy um, research discipline look like? How, how would anyone go about answering that? But sort of that appropriate proportion of exploratory uh, mm -hmm. to confirmatory research, um, it, it, it's likely going to be something that changes over time, changes by discipline, changes for a large number of factors. I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has um, uh, sort of opinions or insights or, or think of what that, what that healthy balance could or should look like. Uh, oh, my, oh, go ahead. No, no sorry, you. Uh, uh, from my perspective, science consists of two equally important parts, discovery, and if you don't explore, you don't discover, full stop, and confirmation. They're both equally important. You need to make sure that you explore and you generate hypotheses to then go off and test in a confirmatory manner. And that's how you discover new knowledge. But you also need to ascertain whether the knowledge you think you have is actual knowledge or not, and whether it's credible or not. Those have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, if either of them takes precedence, you either stifle discovery or you'll create science that's more credible. Um, so for me, it's a balance, it should be a balance. Yeah, so, so maybe if I, if I can add to that, this is, this is an area that um, I find extremely important and I've also been, been working on a little bit of that um, lately that I think um, the, the reform movement, especially in psychology where registered reports have been, I think, uh, uh, taken up most so far and a lot of, um, there's been a lot of debate on reforms and how to improve things, there's been this very strong focus on hypothesis testing and I think the assumption was this is most of the things we do and if you do a pre-registered hypothesis test or one in a registered report, you can still explore after the fact, but I think as we've done this, we've recognized, we started to recognize how what an intricate thing a really strict hypothesis test actually is. So this, and this leads into um, several of what you mentioned about that often uh, pilot data will be really important and that it's such, a, it's such an investment registered report. We really want to make sure that everything is in line, is lined up to have this one really severe test. And there's so much that goes into that. There's so much knowledge and information we need to be ready for that. And a lot of that is not just falling out of a previous confirmatory study, I think. And so I think we need to embrace that more, that there are more different things that we need to do and find out. And some of those might seem boring, like a feasibility study. It's not super exciting, but it's actually important. There needs to be space for that. But also, not just we need outlets for that, but there's also risk of bias in those studies. I mean, it's different. Yeah, like, uh, you know, it, it's not quite the same as with hypothesis test, but still there are risks. And I think it would be great if we could shift a bit our mindset on to think, well, how can we... Like what are the risks for different types of research and how, what are the options that we have in different types of research and minimizing risk of bias without like suffocating that research, you know, so not like registered report format just is not going to work for all sorts of inquiry, but maybe we can have like some elements that work for some things and, and it would be really nice if we could explore that a bit more, I think, in the future. In our last moment, um, before I thank everyone and, and, and dismiss class, so to speak, um, I've been asked by conference organizers to uh, share some summary points about what the uh, what the session has included. So I'm wondering if, if each panelist would, you know, pr provide one take home message that you think is worth um, worth making sure it's, it's documented to the wider meta science community by the end of this. Uh, Stavrula, I'll start with you. Um, I think my take home message might be that it's a win, 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 win situation <laughs> all around for authors, editors, funders, reviewers to actually get on board and start looking at the format as something that we need to scale up because then we will stop um, or we will worry less about how authors select 
uh, which project to do as a registered report versus if you're doing confirmatory research, the community standard at this time is the registered report where you can then go off and explore at the end of the paper as much as you want, so long as you stick to what you said you wanted to do in the main part. So I'm looking forward to the scaling up of the format. Courtney, can I put you on the spot for a take home message you want to make sure it gets documented? Uh, sure. I would say that the take home message for me is that, you know, at least we're not seeing any, we're not seeing evidence that registered reports are having these um, potential negative consequences that I think was feared um, by some skeptics. Um, so, you know, as long as the implementations are good faith implementations, um, they don't, we don't seem to be, they don't, registered reports doesn't seem to be having these uh, knock on unintended negative consequences. And Anne. Yeah, so I think I will also echo that, that registered reports uh, are an incredibly great, cool idea, and they seem to be working so far. Also, I think one thing to highlight would be that in the last years, we haven't seen any great big scandal of something going terribly wrong. I think that's also very interesting to note. Um, and um, But at the same time, I also think we should be a bit cautious um, in how we interpret like what currently gets published as registered reports, because it's very confounded, right? Like it's the, the, the with time, with the people who do it, with the research questions, and we just should keep that in the back of our minds as we go along and see how things work out. I want to thank you on, on behalf of all the attendees also. Um, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you for sharing uh, your experiences uh, and the ongoing research. And we look forward to more of that in the future. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll close the session. I think we'll put up the, um, the closing slide right now and encourage folks to hang out in the Remo uh, session and uh, be looking forward for, for future events. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.